Um, yeah, and I absolutely love yeah. your work. And I know I tell you this all the time, and you're probably like, dude, please stop. But I do. <laughs> I love your work. I love your lighting. Oh, I you, really man. admire everything you you do, everything you've been doing. And I've you know, been following you for for a while now, and and I always feel like astonished by all the stuff that you come up with. And and every time I look at your reel, like it it ignites like a fire inside of me because I'm like, this is so beautiful. Like, and I, I aspire to like, to get to Zach's level someday. So I do want to get to know you a little bit better. And I, you know, how, how did you grow up? Like, you know, how did that, you know, how was that? Oh, like? well, first of all, thank you, man. I mean, you're, I, I take a lot of inspiration from your work, man. I check out no. your stuff all the time and it's, <laughs> Thanks, uh, that's why I was so excited to do this podcast, you know, because it's like, we're, we're in the same world and, Man, what what you do is really cool, and, and it's cool to just be in the room with you and just collab with you. But um, as as far as my background, man, um, you know, I was born and raised in L.A. Um, I basically, for for layman's terms, especially if you're not familiar with L.A., um, I grew up more or less like ten miles east of uh of downtown L.A. So okay. I guess it's like kind of East L.A., but not like the city of East L.A. I see. Okay, but, but culturally, right. I grew up in East LA culture, so it's same. Whatever you movies you've seen about it, that's what I grew up with, you know. Right. Um, so, you know, it was in the '90s and things like that. It, it was kind of crazy. So, um, I had an interesting upbringing, and I think I definitely bring, or at least I try to like pull influence from from that experience as a kid, you know, yeah. into my art. Um, a little bit of like a dark influence, I would say. Do you remember um, any anything specifically that that may have triggered your initial inspiration as far as visual art is concerned? Um, well, like as far as visual art, I'm a big movie buff, movie nerd, um, and I just grew up watching like '90s horror movies and things like that. And then later on, like I got into like um, you know, like like two thousand, you know, like early two thousand psychological thrillers. I love like Rec Room for a Dream and like stuff like that. Oh, dude, I fucking love that movie. Yeah, the ending is insane. By yeah, the way. so so yeah, no, the end. Oh my god, that movie it's is a so great. Gnarly ending. So I I love see my favorite genre of movie or film or whatever art in general. Yeah, it's stuff you can't even put a genre onto it because it's yeah. everything combined, right? Yeah, and that's why I love um like move in the and eventually and this leads to eventually I got really really into like. Um, movies that I can only explain as like documentary drama type films, which is like kids and uh, Gummo and things like that. Dude, fucking Jessica keeps trying to get me to watch those. Like those kind of movies are cool. It, kids and Gummo. Like she literally told me yeah, that last week. She's gonna have so to watch that's, those that's two movies. That's two examples, but there's a whole subgenre of like those types of films. Yeah, mid '90s is a, is a recent example of that kind of film. But it's just movies that feel like you're in a time capsule and you feel like you're like someone's just like explaining it. Like, like, you know, you know, when you're in like a, you're at a party or whatever and like someone's explaining a story and they're going into great detail. Like this is how it happened. I love that dude. <laughs> so I love movies like that because if you tell it the right way, it feels so cohesive and it feels, uh, you can feel it. Like you, you, you watch it and you're like, okay, I, I understand. Yeah. I totally get where they were coming from. And um, I love the rawness and um, like like another modern example, which is crazy because the huge actor in it is uh, Uncut Gems, right? I love that movie. That movie's incredible. Yeah, that was just Adam yeah. Sandler. And I, I feel like, you know, um, he may have inadvertently done it to himself purposely or, or maybe not. You know, I mean, he was on mm -hmm. SNL. He's a wonderful, you know, comedian and all that. But he may have typecasted himself at one point. I feel like he definitely did. And I think that movie changed. It his changed life. everything. Like, dude, it was yeah. so fucking good on cut gems. And yeah. And I heard that the DPs and on that film, like did some more or less like experimental stuff that Adam Sandler wasn't really used to. Yeah. Um, and you know, specifically with the, with the choice of lenses, all tight lenses. Yeah. Like he was like, dude, like, like a I, couple wides, but it was all like tight, just lenses. tight and, and like uncomfortable. Like, well, cause he said like, sometimes I was doing um, a scene and I wasn't even aware of the fact that they were even filming me because the camera was so far away. Cause it was such a tight shot and they're on like a 200 millimeter. Yeah, <laughs> like, dude. And, and, it, and that's really a <laughs> awesome and creative way to try to get a different because performance. you're getting, you're getting an authentic 
uh, performance because they can't even see the camera. They can't see it. So they're only reacting upon the story. Right. Yeah. Um, what's interesting, too, about the Safdie brothers, which were the two uh, directors of that film, um, is they wrote that story for Adam Sandler to star in it 10 years before he did it. Wow. That's how genius these guys are is they like came up with the story and you know, they, they had another movie. Uh, they, they had a couple of films that like ended up blowing up. Like, uh, they did one called good time before that okay. with, uh, Robert Pattinson sure. from twilight. Yeah. And if you haven't seen that movie, definitely check that out. Um, same kind of film, very intense, like psychological thriller kind of thing. Uh, and it's like pace, the pacing is great. Like from the start to finish, it's like, you can't stop watching it. Yeah. And that movie was pretty critically acclaimed. And I, I guess they like made enough connections through their first two films, um, that they somehow got on Adam Sandler's desk and I guess he read it and he was like, let's do this yesterday. Like that's fucking now, cool. like let's get on it. The fact that he would agree to that, um, which I can see that happening because there's, there's, there's gotta be like a point in your career where you're like, I want to try something different. Like I want to reinvent yeah. myself. Is this the time to do it? And I'm sure that's yeah. gotta be incredibly uncomfortable. You Especially know? if you own like a production company yeah. that you star in all the films, that's gotta be a lot of pressure, right? Sure. No, I can only imagine. You know, and you have a branding that's been around since like the early nineties. It's like, man, if only I could just kind of like step out of this brand for a second. And he also quite often employs his friends. Yeah. Which I'm sure is a ton of pressure as well, yeah. because I, I'm, I mean, I'm not quite sure how, what role that plays in, in, in what features these guys undertake, but I'm mm -hmm. sure it might, you know, yeah, if like you know Rob that these Snyder guys and all those guys, yeah, like, you know, they're yeah. in like every movie. They're in all of his films, which I think is a beautiful thing. I love the fact that these guys are doing that, you know? It's beautiful, but that's hard. That's so hard to pull off. Yes. Because if you, if you think, like, from, like, a casting perspective, like, would they have made different choices if there was, a, like, a, like a you know, like a casting individual who's very particular? Like, that person is not going to fit for that role. Like, what are you doing, Adam Sandler? They had to have changed the story to fit right. the cast. I mean, there's no getting around that, yeah. you know, like. But but it also works out sometimes like like my two biggest examples, which are my two favorite Adam Sandler films are uh, Waterboy and uh, Fifty First Dates. Yeah, that's dope. You know what I mean? Lil Nicky. Do you remember Lil Nicky? Do you well, like that's that what one? I'm saying? Can yeah. you imagine Rob Schneider without like like those movies without him? Like it just wouldn't. No. It would. It just Maybe. wouldn't work. Maybe, but. I don't know. I I personally love Rob Schneider. I love all, all the yeah. shit that he does. So I'm down with the Rob, but I love to see it. I, for me, like I love that rotate, like that, um, that, that consistent cast of, of folks in, um, in Adam Sandler's films. It kind of seems almost like familiar and in, in like a friend type way. Like where like, you feel like you're, you may know these guys because like you've like seen a family them. kind of yeah. thing, right? You've like, seen them in films. You grew up watching these growing films. Up, you just yeah. know them almost. Yeah. yeah. So even if one doesn't even really fit for that specific role, like you're like, but I'll forgive that. I'll forgive it. It just works. Yeah. It fucking works. Like, yeah. He, it's, it's just one of those things like, you know, like you see a Rob, or like you see an Adam Sandler movie, you see David Spade, you yeah. see Rob Snyder, you see like, those reoccurring characters and you just know what it is like it's like a, it's like um it's very similar to like you know like clerks and like yeah. uh jay and silent bob and stuff like that you right. know like all those kind of films was that 90s or was that early 2000s um it started in the 90s and then Did, it went into the 2000s there was some pretty dope stuff happening i feel like and maybe i'm i'm looking back with like you know like rose colored glasses i'm not really sure but like when i look back in the 90s i'm like stoked on it i'm like dude like i love so all those music so you grew up in the 90s yeah what are some music videos that really sparked your imagination like early on like before you were a, um, a, a director yeah so i grew up you know when when it was like a lot where there was like a lot of like uh like like I feel like hip hop definitely had like its big resurgence and it was like blowing up at the time and evolving. So I was like really big on like uh Missy Elliott videos, Outcasts, like Busta Rhymes, like I loved like those like weird like it was like cinematic, but it was also like trippy and kind of weird kind of style. 
and they were really like experimenting and kind of pushing the limits of like, like they were doing things and like, especially Missy Elliott videos, I would say, I mean, they weren't even doing in movies, right? Like weird things where they're like upside down in the frame and things like that. It's kind of crazy. Like yeah. it's intense. The you beautiful know? stuff. Yeah. So that was a big influence for me. Do you remember the Outcast one, Roses? That, that was really a really that awesome video, video. Yeah, that one was so creative. Like I, I love the storytelling on that, the pacing. Um, you know, like it it had like a movie vibe, and this is this is what I loved about music videos, right? It has like a cinematic quality to it, but there's something different. Um, since it was such a short form of media that they were able to just experiment and do cool things. Like even like in that, in that, uh, music video in particular, like, uh, the scene where she's driving and they simulate the car crash. Right. Yeah. That That's almost dope. like a kill bill weird, like, exp like, you know what I mean? The way they did it, like they like changed the lighting as she crashed in the background. It was like paper mache almost like, yeah. they would never do that in the movie unless it was yeah. like, again, like a kill bill weird, like a, uh, experimental film like so yeah, some quentin tarantino shit yeah right so to do that in like a mainstream r&b rap song to me was so cool to see like it was like because my whole thing like you know i came from like the alt alternative world right so for me i appreciate any time that pop culture references anything that has to do with like alternative or like something that's more like kind of off the wall yeah um just because i i think it's cool I, I like i like mixing pop like i love modern pop artists for example because uh i love how they mix you know it's like a, it's like a general pop vibe but then they'll like they'll bring in influence from like punk or they'll bring in influences from like metal or like horror movies or like like all these different like aspects of like uh alt culture and it and but but it still has like that uh that pop formula to the music so it's it, so it still is, uh, is super catchy still digestible it's still digestible yeah but you're 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 slowly like kind of introducing people to like a uh to like a, a different side of art that they maybe haven't explored yet so that's true i love it's, when artists do that kind of it's stuff. like a, a little injection of of um it's almost like derailing if you really yeah. do some investigating as a as a spectator as a viewer as a you know you can really find some really cool stuff like those cool little like um what do they call like nest eggs where they call them easter eggs like the oh, like easter the eggs easter yep. eggs that they yep. have and like certain stuff like that um I, I saw a really cool video recently that Pharrell one mm -hmm. you've been fucking really stoked on that one ollie cash and cash out so good how do you feel about that i love this it it's dope right I, I, yeah i <laughs> Yeah, this kind of goes into the whole thing that I've, I've been talking about recently is like, man, like the 3D wave is taking over and I'm Fuck all it about is, it. Dude. As someone that's a camera person, right? Yeah. Like I am not at all threatened by it. I'm stoked on it because I feel like that is going to open up so many different possibilities to like what we can do with our videos. Like as it becomes more accessible and just more streamlined and easy and and your computers can handle it easier as they like optimize it more man like i think you know we're, we're going to be able to create those like mtv level videos at such a smaller budget sure i agree you know it, it's just going to open up the possibilities to where it's like really you're literally only uh limited by like creativity i think that's i think that's where we're heading is, is that something that you currently have in your in your um in your tool belt 3d modeling it, or is that something that you can foresee in the future that you'd like to work on like where are you currently at with that because for myself personally i mean i am not even slightly close to even be able to you know unravel all of that is the 3d modeling world um yeah so it's it's definitely it's definitely in the plans i i would i've uh so i've i've worked with a couple of 3d artists on a couple of projects so i know kind of the process and the workflow um, I just haven't done it myself, but I have like kind of messed with some of the programs. Um, a lot of this stuff is being done on the, uh, the unreal engine, which okay. is, uh, used, uh, primarily to create video games. But as of recent, they've added a couple of different tools that really help, uh, you know, videographers and cinematographers like adding like lighting 
and like adding environments and being able to like manipulate like like import uh footage and in, into it like green screen footage into unreal right and like removing the green screen and then kind of like manipulating whatever subject you filmed on a green screen and making them look like they're in like the desert or in uh in the snow or like something crazy like that right where it would cost you know thousands of dollars to get these crazy like pan in shots like where there's like a crazy like moonlight spotlight on someone like you couldn't do that there's it's literally impossible unless you had like a gigantic uh you know one of those like warner brothers studios with like gigantic uh 10k lights and things like that that would you know like essentially unless you're you have a doja cat or on ariana grande budget right you're not doing that practically it's just impossible Right, but so, now it's becoming a reality now, though. It's becoming more attainable right. to that mid-range, that, that like kind of mid-range budget that I think a lot of people that like are like colleagues with us and people in this industry are working in, where it's like you might have a decent budget, but it's, you know, it's not pop level, but you want to, you want to create that quality, right? Sure. I you want to match it. Everyone's like after... The, it's it's always the best, right? Everybody always wants the best for their music. It, it, writing yeah. a song is so personal, like it's, yeah. it's so intimate, and I think it creating a, a, like a visual um, art to represent what the art has created musically, it's a lot of pressure, but it's also a, like a, a great responsibility to take on as a director, as a DP, as an editor, mm -hmm. as you know, as, as you, you know, everybody else that's involved in on, you know in, in production. It's just uh, it's it's such a wild thing to even think about, you know. Like it is kind of crazy, right? Because like yeah. as, as someone that came from music myself, I totally understand um, you how played, personal music is. And you play drums, and you played I, in the I band. Mean, yeah, so I I I came from like playing in bands and stuff like that. That's how I kind of like got my start in this whole uh, scene in this whole like entertainment world is uh playing in bands and stuff so i totally get you know how personal it is to have to you know trust a guy with a camera ultimately or a person with a camera to they, to like explain kind of like the meaning of the song and say okay i'm trusting you to best represent uh my piece of art yeah i, I get how personal that is and i get how much trust you have to have to uh to allow a videographer or editor or whoever to, uh, you know, to work on your art. I get it. What would be your biggest inspiration? Like what, what music video, like, would you say is your biggest inspiration? Um, it's tough. It's tough because, you know, I have a lot of inspirations, but if we're talking, are we, are you, are you asking in frames of like my first influence or like my current biggest influence? I would, I would say current, current. Yeah. Okay. If we're talking music videos, I really like uh, Max Moore's videos. If you're familiar with him, he's done like, um, he's done like knock loose and like code orange. Did like I, fucking, a lot of, I love knock loose. Yeah. So he he's he's done like Little Lotus and like a lot of like the modern like alternative kind of artists. His stuff is cool. Um, I like his stuff because it, it feels very raw, but it's like at a high quality. It's like at a high level, um, and that's kind of like what I'm. I guess what I'm trying to do. Sure. Where it's like not super overproduced, but like I could tell a lot of work put in, was put into it. You know what I mean? It, it, but I could tell it came from one guy. Like the concept is always from like a person. Um, and you can, I feel like you can always kind of tell mm -hmm. when it, uh, when the, the concept comes from like a certain person's brain versus like, oh, this is just like a labels concept. Right. You know what I mean? Where it was just kind of like given to you and then you give them a treatment and then you do the video. So... Yeah, I would say Max overall, as far as like modern uh, videographers, I love what Max Moore is doing. His stuff is amazing. Um, you know, he he's really like taking like the budget that he's given and like maximizing it completely. Like he's done some some crazy stuff. Um, there's a video he did called um, "Swallowing the Rabbit Hole" by uh, Code Orange, and they're yeah. like a kind of like an industrial. 
I don't even know how to describe their music, but they're like an industrial metal kind of band. They're they're on the same label as Knock Loose. They're on a or on Roadrunner. Um, but it uh, man, he 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 created some cool like he worked with like a couple of makeup artists and just like created some cool concepts and like I feel like explained their music in a way that no one else did before. Mm, I see. Um, because their music is definitely not accessible. So for him to like take a very like, I would say pretty like harsh style of music, like pretty edgy, like kind of hard to grasp uh, style of music and really give it like a proper branding. I noticed the difference before that video came out and after. Right. Uh, Same thing with Knock Loose. All the videos that he did with them, like completely like they went from like a, a, a very like you know, underground hardcore band yeah. to like, you know, like headlining festivals. So um, I noticed when uh, directors like that kind of like their videos make a difference. Like it actually like changes artists kind of careers in a certain way. Which one did he do for Knock Loose? Uh, was, was, was it the Mistakes Like Fractures or was it that one? He uh, he did that one and then he did the, the OG one, uh, Billy No Mates okay the uh the one that has like the dog barks and all that stuff yeah 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 Yeah, uh counting worms where he's it's literally like there's like a scene where he's just like counting like filming worms moving (laughs) but that's like that's like that's the video that blew them up though because they like they filmed it in like this like little basement and it was like like it was like a whole mosh pit and things like that and then they just had like a super macro close-up shot of like worms Sure. And then immediately went back to the show, uh, just intensity and just the way he built the, the tension. It was uh it was almost filmed like fight club. So I yeah. really liked that video. <laughs> yeah. Like even the colors, it was like those harsh green, like it wasn't a pretty yeah. video. It was like very like gnarly looking. Yeah. And it had like a, like a classic throwback look to it. Do you feel like all that isn't, in, is, is intentional? Do you believe or? I think so. Yeah. Yeah, I would say okay. so. Um, I I would say like everything from like from their branding is pretty intentional, and I think that's why, you know, out of all the bands from that style, like the heavier side of music, that's probably why they ended up flourishing. Sure, is I think they're very aware of what they're doing, and they're mm-hmm. not like ashamed, and they're not afraid to like just be themselves. Right. You know. Yeah, I mean. How did you feel the, the the first morning that you woke up after quitting your day job? Because that's the dream of many artists in yeah. in, in many totally. in many different um, arenas, right? Like many different um, yeah. It was uh, it, it was like it, it was like a little bit a little bit of fear for sure. It was like nerves kicking in for sure. Um, but you know the reason why I did it is that the kind of like the stars just kind of aligned at a certain moment. And, um, there was so much work coming in that like, I, there was literally one day where I was just like, my phone just got blown up. Yeah. Like it was just one of those, like from one day to the next, like one day I had like one gig lined up the next day I had like 10. You know what I mean? And, I was just thinking about it like after like I was stoked on it, you know, like wow, this is so so cool. But in my head I'm like, well, I have work on all like most of these days. What were you doing at the time? Um so I was actually a, a server. I was, I was uh, serving at, at restaurants and stuff like that. Okay. Um and you know, given that was that was cool money, it was decent, like it was definitely like not bad. Um you know, it's like am I going to really turn down all these video jobs that like most people would die to even have the opportunity to do to continue working at this restaurant that doesn't care realistically whether I'm around or not, they would replace you in two seconds. That's absolutely true. Like, yeah, you know, so it was just kind of like, you know what, let's just take a risk. What's the worst thing that could happen? I go back to the, the serving job. You know what I mean? Like I know these jobs work quit you come back like <laughs> yeah <laughs> they'll, hide, they'll hire you back dude. like so so it wasn't like a huge risk really in my head i was like it's not that big of a deal like 
the worst thing that happens, I get another serving job. It'll be fine, you know. So I just tried it out. Um, and very, I'm very lucky. I didn't have like the most bills at the time that I did this. My bills were pretty minimal. Um, you know, and, uh, it, it just, it just like never, it ne at once it started, it never stopped. Like there were, there were like a couple like slightly slow moments in between, but like the gigs just kept coming. They, they never fully stopped. So it just, I was I'm very fortunate. It just like, you know, right place, right time. I, I made the jump probably at the right time when it was just, it just felt right. And, um, you know, like I just like dedicated myself to it. Like, just like, just like a lot of people dedicate themselves to a job, right? You know, yeah. That realistically doesn't reward them the way it should be. Yeah. You're rewarding you're them in putting a lot of energy into, yeah. um, a company, whether it's small or, or whether it's, you know, large corporation, but you're in putting a lot of energy into something that is not yours. If yeah. someone was like renting in a building for 40 years, like why would you do that? Would you do that? I hope not. You're ultimately building someone else's brand. Correct. So yeah. you only, I mean, I'm not really quite sure how you guys feel spiritually, but I mean, for me, like I, I'm not really quite a hundred percent certain, but from what I can gather, I only live one life. So I want to try to maximize what I can do on this earth while I'm here. Absolutely. <laughs> so it's like, yeah. why not do what you love and what yeah. you would like to do? You know, instead of <laughs> yeah. building for somebody else, which sounds kind of, I don't know, that sounds kind of mean, but it's like, but in, in, in a way you do have to be able to separate yourself and be in, in a way, um, selfish. And maybe that's not the right word. You have maybe to be just a little bit selfish. I mean, that's, on that's who life, you, you know, yeah, who you are and who you want to be. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's really, um, really important, but, um, it, it is important. And, and, you know, like. I think a lot of people that grew up in Southern California can relate to this, but it's like we all, you know, saw people growing up and, and, you know, more power to them if this is like the life that they wanted to live. But like we all saw people growing up, they kind of just like settled and just like whatever job they did after high school, that's what they ended up doing. Yeah. I've seen a lot of that. Sad. Yeah. And, and again, yeah. I don't mean this to be disrespectful or like judgmental in any way. Like I don't, I'm not that kind of person, but like, you know, at the end of the day, you have to you, you have to observe those kinds of uh, things that people get into and decide, do you want that to be a possibility or do you want to try to do more, do something that's more so in line of like you, you that matches your personality, something that is more in line with you as a person versus like just kind of choosing a job that's like safe or like a job where it's like, oh, well, I don't. I work here and that's fine. I'd work this many hours, make this much money versus like starting a business, which is like, I think scary to a lot of people because it's like, well, how do I do that? And like, how do I build it? And like stuff like that. Um, I think that's the real risk is knowing that the easy way out is always there. Right. And then choosing to not take that easy way out. I absolutely agree. Yeah. You know. In in speaking of that, that kind of reminds me a little bit, and I'm not really quite sure if I'm, you know, um, if there's a correlation or not. But in film currently, um, I feel like there's a certain safety net. There's a certain sense of the lack of maybe um, inspiration. Maybe no. There's actually I feel like a lot of inspiration, but maybe the lack of um, maybe wanting to take a risk, I would say. Right. On certain films. And, you know, Ali and I have had many, many heated debates <laughs> in privacy about Marvel films, you know, DC films, you know, yeah. franchise films. Um, uh, you know, what is the other one? Fast and Furious. You know, I think mm -hmm. they've done like 20 of them. Who knows how many? I mean, yeah, there there's are too many. Well over 10. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, I feel like that's you know these 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 companies are afraid to maybe take on a a film that's more creative. Or maybe mm -hmm. could probably take a smaller budget you know to produce exactly, but they're still afraid to do it because they're not quite sure if it's going to produce revenue. You know they're not quite sure if it's going to be a hit in the box office. Yeah, um, how do you feel about that? You know, as a, as a director yourself, do do you enjoy the Marvel films? Do you enjoy the the franchise films? How do you feel about that? 
Yeah, I mean, um, it, you know, that, and that's the, it, it, this is like a bigger conversation that even goes into like um, bigger budget productions in general. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and as someone, I have not worked on uh, projects even close to that level. So anything that I say might even seem ignorant or, or uninformed at the very least. But in my experience, it just seems like a lot of times they're just kind of like choosing, you know, consistency over like depth or quality and things like that. Again, I, I've not worked on, you know, these major production film sets, but, um, you know, it, it, it must be a little depressing because it's like you have like it's to the point on these kind of sets where like you, you literally have to spend a certain amount of money because the movie has to make this much and this is the budget and there's no negotiations. And that's, that's what is uh, very unfortunate to me. Even, even like more than just criticizing the movies themselves, I'm more interested in talking about like the, the actual, like how the movies are made because like, I think that's a bigger picture of like the problem with those kind of films. Right. Is that, you know, the, they're, they're already figured out before they're even filmed and there's no creative input that's even allowed, you know, because these scripts, I'm a very like kind of like I, I make scripts and I, you know, I make treats treatments and, and storyboards and things like that. But like, I like, I personally, me personally, I like to come up with a lot of things on the spot on set. Sure. And I think that's probably impossible on these kind of sets where you see a, a wall and you're like oh let's do a cool effect where we go around the you know what i mean right things like that that are unplanned i think are almost impossible to do when you're on these like super tight budgets where you're spending millions of dollars a day and i think that's the problem is you're almost like this might sound controversial because i know that the film industry really likes like pre-planning things like over pre-planning i think sometimes you like almost pre-plan to the point where it sabotages your own creativity because I, you're yeah. not allowing for you like if you're pre-planning in my honest opinion i always try to do this you should pre-plan for creative flow you should not just always stick to the story 1000 percent because until you're there with all this the characters and the actors and the lighting set up like you don't really know yeah, you know. and and, I, and if I mean, it's like when you're in flow state, you know, like when you're yeah. running, you know, over, you know, a mile or two or three, and you you go in like flow state, or like you're playing guitar, and like you get lost in space and time, or like sometimes I'm sure when you're filming that that can probably happen to you. It happens when people are having sex, you know. It's like you get in the flow. Really, yeah, you, you know, it's like you you lose you lose a notion of time. Like it's like you're not even yeah. really present in in that. It's like you you're so present that you're not even aware that you're present. You're yes. lost in a space of time, and I think if that's missing in in film, you know, on on set, yeah, that's terrifying. Because then, how could you give it what's living inside of you, like what's really truly the beautiful part that could it could potentially be? Like it's now no longer a possibility, and I think that that's yeah. where a lot of like I'm, I might have to go against that for a second. Okay, sure, okay. if you would like for a second, because I mean, I told you earlier, like I was I was like an extra. In mm -hmm. like a movie, I just went to go do that. Shit. Right. Um, it was pretty fun, but I mean, I got to witness like how they like did shit. And when you have kids on set, like during a movie, everything is real tight. Has to be even tighter than like you know normal. Yeah. And it's so it's so strange because they don't they can only keep them there for a certain amount of hours. Yeah. Because they're children and they can't like work. It's like three hours or something like that yeah so when they're not on set like nobody's getting paid yeah no like none, none of the extras like <laughs> nobody they'll keep you in like a break room and you just gotta chill there and then once you're back on set like it starts again and you're like real tight you gotta yeah because they're always like keeping still track get paid of for the day i mean I, th I think i don't think that changes yeah but it's it it can change because they can just send you home Ah, I see what you're saying. They can, yeah. And, yeah. and they did. For they, extras, they sent, that's, for extras sense, yeah. that, that is a, a very a variable ah, rate for sure. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. it's, it, it can fuck you over a little bit. Well, I mean, on I, a big I, scale when you have thousands of extras, right, where it's like, you know. 
Well, you know, I think I think with these big, you know, franchise films that we're talking about, I think yeah. that the the biggest, you know, factor that can really present these films in in front of your your you know phone screens and your computer screens and TV screens is is really um, due to the the immense amount of marketing dollars that go right behind um, these films, right? So yeah, as a you know music video director, what do you think is the biggest marketing um tool for musicians you know i mean we've seen so fucking many of them it's just insane i mean well what what do you think is is the top one right now um it depends i think depends on what you're mar- what you're marketing um i think instagram reels are probably the biggest right now yeah tiktok's big too but it's big in different ways yeah like tiktok i don't think is a music video thing and i don't think tiktok cares about music videos that's more of like a it's an individual like like if a song blows up on tiktok it's because like a person on tiktok made content with that song yeah there was like a cool dance yeah like a dance that went a viral. dance or like yeah. a comedy skit sort of challenge right, right. yeah there's always a challenge and involved or like yeah. a joke or like something like that um instagram reels they're cool because instagram's really pushing them right now right and um they're getting pretty niche. Like they're getting into that TikTok territory of like, okay, we know that you like this kind of movie or this kind of artist. So let's give you all like, that. <laughs> let's give you that. Like it'll just start feeding you stuff. Yeah. So um, reels are cool. And uh, re- reels are cool because j- just for the fact that like, you know how it is nowadays, like everyone consumes things in such quick little bites Realistically, most people listening to a song are going to listen to 20 seconds of that song. Really? Yeah. Most That's people terrifying. won't listen to the whole song. Do you do that, Ollie? I don't. I absolutely do that. Oh, my I, I, God. I feel, you know what? I, you know what? I, I, I just lied right now. Sometimes I do just listen to a couple seconds. Oh, no. If it really captures my attention, I will listen to the whole thing. <clears throat> um. Like, cause yeah, if you're scrolling, if you're scrolling, I'm sure you've done oh, it without even scrolling. realizing it. Yeah. And it just, it, well, that's it, what I'm saying. You're it, listening it, to a couple seconds at a time, right? I'm talking well, actual albums. Well, cause it, it, it just, it makes me, I feel like an old man sometimes. Cause I, I still remember, um, uh, you know, when I was a kid, I'd go to the CD store, was it FYE or you yeah. know, like Virgin Records. Yeah. And it's, you know, I didn't know what some of the records sounded like. I would look at literally just like the album art and I'd be like, this looks dope. I'm going to take it home and see if it's good. And I would take it home. Sometimes it was good, and sometimes it wasn't. Um, Is that and, crazy? You used to have to do that. Like, yeah, it was. Kind of, yeah. You would have to judge the album art, and yeah. that's how you like chose. Yeah, or the you music. would look at the, like the band or whatever, and be like, the, you know, the, you know yeah. How, and you and know. I, I used to do like order CDs off of catalogs, which is even worse because you saw this tiny little image. Yeah. Of the CD, and Dude, you went to, beyond what I was doing. I never did the catalog thing. I would literally just go to like the record store, and I would just pick up something that looked cool, and I would take yeah. it home and hope that it was good. Yeah. But you know what's funny about that is oftentimes like it initially wasn't great to my ear, but then I would listen to it so mm-hmm. much because that's like I only had like a few CDs. <laughs> you had like I'd be two like, CDs, you're like, yeah, like I would eventually get into it. Like, this is actually pretty fucking good, you know? <laughs> <laughs> like it's like, you know. You kind of like build a tolerance to music in a weird way. You kind yeah. of like learn to enjoy it. Yeah. Because it's, it's like it's all you have. So you're like, right. you know. But what's interesting is like shortly after that era, we got like MySpace and all that stuff. I, I, yeah, I remember MySpace. And then once, once MySpace came, I mean, everything got a lot easier. It became so much easier to just consume media. And there was even as bad as it was, there was like LimeWire. Yeah. You know, and I know it was like virus ridden and stuff like that. But like, as bad as it was, man, I discovered so much music through LimeWire. Like, some artists that I still listen to today. So it's kind of crazy. Like, blows my mind. For real. Yeah. No, I, I remember that too. That, I that was I discovered Soldier Boy like ten thousand times because uh, Fifty Cent in the Wait. Club dot MP three. Yeah, every single one. He, he did that on purpose. Yeah, that was that's how smart he yeah, was. Yeah, that was like just smart like marketing on her behalf. It's like, yeah, he's you like know. I'm going to literally like title this another artist. Yeah, I I remember like yeah that and, and that's such a, like a ballsy move because I I remember I would be trying to download a specific band and it was a different band. And then it, yeah. it was so widespread. I remember Mudvayne doing that with corn. Yeah, it's crazy. Like Mudvayne like said that it was a corn video, and then it was like a Mudvayne. <laughs> like so crazy. That was a whole thing, dude. Yeah. And it was like a marketing tactic that 
the label's probably low-key signed off on. I'm sure. <laughs> they're like, well, if they're going to steal the music, might as well, yeah. you know, market it and get, it, get a, you know, aside from Metallica, they were the only ones that weren't down with that, but everyone else like got a little piece of it. And But in hindsight, do you think that uh, Lars Ulrich was right? Because, I mean, he was... He was one of one of the first people. He was to, technically wrong, <laughs> was he? Do you think so? Like, how do you? Well, how yeah, do you, because who who buys music anymore? It's all about streaming. Explain right. the whole story to me. He was technically book. wrong. Well, so at the time, you know, people were um, illegally downloading music that um, that these artists were releasing, and uh, it was file sharing. And it was uh, Napster, yeah, Napster, yeah. It was LimeWire, which was all those. Be- right before uh, LimeWire. It oh, was yeah. like a couple of years before, right? And so, you, you know, one of the first musical artists to be outspoken about how he felt about, you know, Napster uh, was Lars Ulrich. And he was actively, you know, with his attorneys attempting to sue certain people that were yeah. downloading or illegally downloaded his music. So I think that, you know, he, he may have seen something in where that could have been leading and that how could that could affect, you know, uh, Metallica sales and, mm-hmm. and whatnot. And I'm sure he was very threatened by all of that. Do you think that you know he was right in that aspect though, in trying to protect what the industry was at the time? I mean, he was technically in the right. You know what I mean? Like, I, it's your art; you have every right to protect it. But if we're looking in hindsight, he did not. He definitely did not predict where the industry ended up going. Right. Yeah. You know, because the n- literally no one like physically pays for music anymore. That's true. I mean, there's a couple like people collect records and things like that. But, um, I mean, you know, everyone has Spotify or Apple Music. Um, I'm going to assume that in the last five years, 99% of all uh, royalties besides, like, movie, like, Stranger Things and movies and things like that came from, like, Spotify for Metallica. So they didn't really predict (laughs) the future correctly, even though at the time they were probably, I mean, they were definitely legally in the right. It's their music. You have the right to... Right. Protect your music, but yeah. yeah, it was a little out of touch. But you know, I I wasn't there when it was happening, so maybe it looked really bad at the time, and you know, maybe not because I th- I mean, if maybe maybe if more artists at the caliber that Metallica was at at the time like had banded together and had mm. the same sentiment that Lars Ulrich had, that could have fucking changed everything. It could have changed maybe. everything. Yeah, maybe Who CDs would knows? still be sold. Yeah, that's insane. But it's crazy because then you wouldn't have like YouTube in the way that it is right now, and like yeah, and without YouTube, you wouldn't have Spotify, mm. you know, and like all that kind of stuff. So, and realistically, you probably wouldn't have TikTok. Yeah, like because social media wouldn't have advanced in and the they, way that it did, and that broke a lot of barriers for so many different types of you know artistic content creators. Oh, of course, yeah. yeah. I mean, again. You know, like YouTube was like the source for every music video ever made since the beginning. Like that's, I mean, it was made for like other things. It was made for like comedy skits and stuff like that. But ultimately like YouTube was used to like store people's music videos. That's why people used it, you know? So with that being said, it's like, how, like how, how different would the internet in general be? If like YouTube didn't allow that, if they just like said no music allowed on YouTube, hmm. it probably wouldn't have blown up in the way that it did. Right. It would just be another like Vimeo or like Daily Motion yeah. or one of those like random. That's true. You know what I mean? Like those unknown video sites. That's true, and it did open a, a you know a big you know it opened a path for many different artists to you know make careers out of dude. I mean, there's fucking artists doing instrumentals and touring and making like a fucking living. It's insane. Uh, FKJ. It, yeah, it, and I'm not really quite sure if that would have been possible with you know the way that the industry, the music industry worked, you know, 30 years ago. Yeah, and then like guys like like uh, Thundercat and like Flying Lotus oh, and stuff like that. Though. You know what I mean? The guys like that are like literally internet artists. Right. There's no way. <laughs> and 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 I'm a big fan of his, right? He's he was just he would go way over people's heads if there weren't like an internet culture that kind of cultivated a sound where people understood, like people understand where he's coming from. It's kind of like anime influence, and then it's like fusion jazz, like stuff like that. 
um, or like Flying Lotus's case, he has like visuals that go with his music. So you're, you get it. It's kind of like a trippy, almost like a hallucination kind of music. I haven't heard that in a long time. Yeah. Um, I only associate them because like uh, because Thundercats like played live with Flying Lotus and stuff like that. But like art, I just say like artists like that because those are big examples of like artists that I definitely wouldn't have gotten into uh, or even known about if it weren't for like weird like internet communities, like playlists and stuff like that. Um, that kind of led me there, you know. No, I feel you though, man. Dude, but I've been looking at your Instagram, and there's a lot of dope shit that you've been making lately, man. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. The Safe Not Sound video looks insane, man. It is like a movie. Dude, thanks so much. I even, I even seen Chris comments on it, too. He's <laughs> just, just like, Yo, it looks like a movie. And I was wondering, like, what goes into that? Like, how do you make something that cinematic for a music video? Um, You know what, man? Like, a lot of that was... uh picking the right location i'm big on location like that that's I, that's probably obvious maybe like if you if you do this kind of stuff pretty often but like if you have the right location and then the second thing especially like because this was like a time piece kind of thing like it was supposed to have like a like a 20s kind of like speakeasy kind of feel if you have the right wardrobe right hair like like all that like style so like style we had a stylist super important super crucial having a stylist, having a good makeup artist, um, good location that like fits the energy. Because if you don't have a good location, I mean, then you need a set designer and then you need time and you need to build the whole set. That is, I mean, it's cool. Like that's, if you have the time to do that, that's incredible. Like it usually comes, that's the way the videos really come out the best. But yeah, that's you know, true. When you're, when you're on a limited budget and limited time, um, I do a lot of research on locations and like I will literally not the, do the shoot if, if I can't find the right spot for it or I'll change the concept. Yeah, they, that you could know, like, completely ruin the whole the whole thing. Yeah, so for me, the first thing was having the right location and we, we were lucky and we found like this cool like, it's really cool like a uh, kind of like low key spot in downtown LA which sounds funny because it's downtown. Um, but it's like on like a weird side street and it's like this cool, bo it's like almost like a banquet hall, but it looks vintage. Like it looks like almost like a speakeasy kind of thing, but it's big. It has like a multiple rooms. Um, so we filmed that there. Um, it was just kind of like right place, right time. Like we had the right people involved, right makeup artist, um, stylist, all people that I still use now. Um, and yeah, it was just like, I guess like planning things out and just like matching the... Uh, just Matt really trying to match the story to to the song and just make it cohesive so one of the the things that always catches my eye is is your lighting your 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 choice of lighting mm -hmm. it's 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 really really creative and I, I think it adds it's a huge component to what you do as an artist so for that one particularly that one specifically you were shooting in um, a banquet hall so how did you decide to light that? Um, so that was lit. It, it was, uh, so it was lit with like a three point lighting setup. Um, but the way that I chose to light it, um, was it, it depended on the scene because we did have like, kind of like, a, um, like a concert, uh, lighting setup, uh, at the venue that we were filming at. So we had like these really cool, it was like a wireless lighting setup. So for like all the scenes next to the stage, we had like these, um, all these like moving headlights and things like that that you could program with like a, a laptop and um and it made it like really easy to just kind of like change things on the fly but as far as everything else um i like using tube lights i feel like that's like a very under i know you guys have them here you have have the nan lights very clutch um tube lights are cool i'm sure you know this because they're like this it's a very thin angle it's a right. it's a wide angle but it's narrow at the same time so like depending on how you angle the lights um you can really just dial in a certain amount of light towards a very specific direction like what i love doing with tube lights is like just pointing them uh horizontally straight down okay and you can get essentially like a like a honey like if you were to set up like a honeycomb uh soft box without having to like get on the ladder and 
you know, climb and, and rig stuff up to the ceiling. Right. But you get the same level of diffusion and uh, you actually get even more control than a honeycomb because a honeycomb light is still a square. Sure. Versus a tube is, is a thin uh, light that you can literally light just one person with. Right. Um, so I love splitting lights into sections, I guess is the, the, the easy way to answer that question is, yeah, I like to split the lighting into sections. I don't, I'm not a big fan unless it's like a commercial video. I'm not a big fan of just setting like one big soft light and just letting that light everything because then you remove uh, dynamics and shadows. Like um, I know in, in like commercial shoots, it's like common to like, try to eliminate shadows, but I'm really right. big on showing shadows intentionally when I want them. All right. So, I mean, I know that both of y'all are into the, you know, punk rock, rock music, like all that type of shit. Yeah. Sure. I wanted to ask you how you feel about Machine Gun Kelly. Like, does his music feel real to you? Like, how do you, like, how do you feel about what he's done for that scene? Yeah, man. I mean, you know, it, it's a tough question, but like ultimately I would say like, um, you know, I, I definitely, th as, as far as what I know, just, just from being around that world and stuff, like he's definitely like a, like a fan of that music. Like he is definitely something that he's like grown up on. Um, I've known that's like, he, he's done like, uh, rock features and things like that since the beginning. It's not something that he necessarily focused on at first because I know he was trying to be primarily like a hip hop artist, you know. Um, and you know, like he's in he's in the media and he's in the mainstream and things like that. So, you know, my I, I never try to comment on like people's personal lives as as musicians because, you know, you know how it is with musicians. Like I, I don't, it's really like none of my business personally. But like, what I will say. Um, and, th and I've seen this effect personally, like his, his effect on like, like I just call it like guitar music, you can call it rock music, whatever. Like, you know, the fact that like you have so many like pop artists and rappers and just like people that are not from the rock world wanting to make rock music now. And like, it's just like, it's like very trendy now to like wear clothing that's like kind of like a rock style and and you know have like the metal logos and things like that i would say that like mgk has a big part of that and that's like whether you like his music or not um i would say his influence is pretty undeniable honestly um so that would be my answer like and as far as like my opinion on his music personally um i like some of his music you know, like, I don't always go out of my way to listen to it, but, like, there's definitely songs from his that I really like. So, you know, I guess that's that's my view on it. That's true. He's yeah, doing pretty too. good for himself. He's selling out shows. I mean, a lot of people are going yeah. to his shows. Cool. Yeah. I don't know the guy on a personal level, but I like what he, I, I like him as an entertainer, and I like the music that he's making. I think he's a really interesting character, and I, I like him. I like the dude. Um, but it's funny that, that you mentioned that the, the whole, like the, the get up, like the style, like that, yeah. you know, people are adopting, like it, it, I, there was this girl wearing a cannibal corpse shirt that I nice. saw at the grocery store and I was like, Oh, dope. You like cannibal corpse. And she's like, cannibal what now? <laughs> and I was like, Oh, the, the, your shirt, the shirt you're wearing. And yeah, she's yeah. like, Oh, I don't know who, what that is. I just thought it was like a brand. She's like, that's cool. And that's I was like, brand, I mean, yeah. that's cool too, I guess, you know, it made yeah. me a little sad, but you know, I, I'm going to, I'm going to, I think I'm going to be okay. But it's also kind of sick that there's some like <laughs> yeah, normie true. girl that probably like plays volleyball <laughs> yeah. at like her junior college or whatever. Yeah. That's wearing a cannibal corpse, like hammer smash face shirt or whatever. <laughs> yeah, like, that's, that's true, dude. <laughs> dude, could you imagine, like, just, you got to think, when I think about these things, I imagine, like, young me. You know what sure. I mean? Like, me when I was, like, 10, when I was first getting into crazy stuff like this. Could you imagine some, like, normies girl that goes to, like, f like Fullerton College or whatever? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. regular, regular girl. You know yeah. what I mean? Just ironically, or not ironically, just unknowingly wearing a Cannibal Corpse shirt or like any shirt that's even related to like extreme music. That's intense, man. That's cr yeah, that's kind of crazy. It is. That it's infiltrated right. the public in that kind of way. And sometimes they're completely unaware of it, which is even more bizarre. And she's, you know, she's wearing it in public. So you know that yeah. every uh, girl or dude that's looking at her is going to, what is that shirt? 
and right. look it up. And now, true, und- indirectly, Cannibal Corpse just gained like 50 new followers by her wearing that shirt. That's a really dope way to look at it. You know, I like that. Like the non, like gateway keeper mentality. I love that. Like because at the end of the day, man, especially with this like niche genre, at the as big as like rock music can get. It's still a niche genre at the end of the day. So, like, I think we have to, like, take our victories where we can get them. You know what right. I mean? In that world, like, you have to, like, just let people get into it as they will. Don't don't try to, like, because the minute you try to, like, tell them the right or wrong way to get into it, you're going to push them away. Yeah. You know. That's true. So, um, for any... Any person, I don't want to say just any young person, because really, there's really, and you can really change your life at any given moment um, of your life. But what advice would you give to anybody who's maybe possibly frustrated by the um, by the pressure that society has uh, like bestowed upon them or their families and things of that nature, and they want to do something creative? I know it's 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 mm-hmm. probably a you know very daunting process for many people and can be very discouraging in many ways. But right. What what type of advice would you give to somebody who wants to be a you know a director, you know, who wants to be a, a DP, who wants to be a photographer, who wants to be an editor? What, what type of advice would you give them to get started and, and to create a life out of that to create a um you know a, a yeah. living situation? Yeah, I mean you know as someone that grew up in not the best circumstances, I would say. Um, it's it's you know it's probably something that's gonna be very gradual for you. Um, the number one advice that I can give to anyone in the creative world, no matter what, is uh, don't give up because I've seen a lot of people that are super talented try things both in the music and photography and painting and any kind of artistic kind of field, um, and like they didn't get where they wanted to get like you know, within a week and then they just kind of <laughs> give up. And right. it's like, I get why someone would react that way because, you know, you everyone starts off as a sensitive artist where you're like, Oh, I don't want anyone to judge my art. I don't want anyone to like say anything bad about it, but let's be honest. Like you're not going to get what you want right away. You know what I mean? So my main advice, honestly, um, number one thing you have to be able to have thick skin and you have to be able to like you know not give up and and just keep going at whatever your goal is whatever whatever goal your goal is in art like don't give up and and stay consistent that's that's probably the second uh advice piece of advice that i would give anyone uh anyone wondering is like consistency you don't even have to be like the most advanced or like the most like technically talented person. But you, but when you're consistent, when you're like on the ball and you're just dedicating, you know, your time to what you're doing, like someone's going to notice eventually and someone's going to offer you an opportunity. And, uh, you know, from there that that's when you build your skills cause you get in a budget and you have time to like own your skills and do your thing. So, um, yeah, I would say just, you know, give it time overall just give it time and 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 stay consistent because that's those are the two things that i think a lot of artists are kind of hard-headed about and are not willing to you know take the time to do um a lot of people want instant results and as you know that's unfortunately not how this this whole world works it's not the way it works yeah well that was beautifully said i love that I think that brings us to the end. Um, dude, awesome. Zach, thanks for coming by, man. I really appreciate it. Dude, it's, it's a it's a pleasure to have you here with us. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, man. Thank you, man. Hey, thanks for having me. It's, it's a lot of fun. Always a ton of fun to uh, to come hang out. L- love your studio, man. Love the thanks, setup. Thanks, dude. Yeah. And uh, dude, we got to work on something soon. Oh, down, man. I'm down. That'd be really awesome. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, man. Yay! <laughs> Goodbye, everyone. Take care. All right. See you later. Yep. So next time, hit that subscribe button. Subscribe to Pod Bros. You already know what it is. Dude, I need to pee so bad. <laughs> really? <laughs> I, I know. I know the movement. Where it's like, how do I, how do I turn this thing?